Gino, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've wanted to have you on probably since we started. So I'm glad you're here. It is my pleasure and really looking forward to this. Oh, good. Well, you do thousands of these interviews. So even before we just hit record, I just want you to know that I feel how present you are. And that's so humble of you. So I, I love you already. Um, I want everybody to get a sense of your journey before we talk about the newest addition to the buffet. And so I want to go back first, way back mm -hmm. to when did this even begin to spark for you that this was your driving mission in the world to help people work on their own terms, have a life that they designed? Like, where did that start? Because I'm very curious about that. Yeah, yeah. And if you'll allow me, um, I'm going to try and do it in three and a half minutes, which is a big <laughs> request on a podcast. But I think it's really important to create the context, yeah. to connect all the dots. Okay. And so here goes lightning fast, really high level. So, you know, I was raised by an entrepreneurial father in a household that gave me a ton of freedom. And I was a wild and crazy entrepreneur in the making. Um, with six essential traits that we'll talk about later. And so um, survived academics, survived high school with a solid three, 2.3 GPA. My and, guy. Uh, academics are not for me. I, was, I did not go to college. There's no way in hell I was going through college. As my friends went off to college, I went to work. I just want to work. I'm an entrepreneur. And, and so did just that. You know, I describe it as taking my entrepreneur leap around 21. I took over a family business helped an entrepreneurial father save his business. And that's when I really found my knack for helping entrepreneurs, ran that business, turned it around, sold it after about seven years, transitioning the leadership team, the new leadership team, after about a year and a half, and then retired from that and set out to pursue why I believe I'm on this earth. And that's to help entrepreneurs. And in the last 22 years, that's what I've been doing. I have created five very specific pieces of pieces of content, which we can come back to, that it's all about helping entrepreneurs. And so I, my soul was pinged, you know, somewhere in my late 20s as to really understanding that I was an entrepreneur and really understanding I am here to help entrepreneurs and threw myself out there in the world in my early 30s to do just that. And here I am at 55, having helped a whole bunch of entrepreneurs. Yeah, you certainly have. And when you were talking, it was like you were playing my favorite song. And I was just, <laughs> like, you know, I just felt like everything in my body, like, yes, yes, this is like my favorite song and I'm in it. And when you said the words, I survived, you know, education, yeah, that's exactly, yeah. I never said those words, but that's exactly how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. I also had like a C average couldn't stand it, was so bored the whole time. And then I was like, wait, I just, I really want to get my hands into stuff that I'm passionate about. It's not like I'm not capable of learning things. It's just that the system feels broken. Can we talk about that for one second? Sure. What is it that we need to be aware of with that? Those of us who went to school mm -hmm. um, and those of us who now have kids who are in school, because I feel like in a lot of ways, what we don't even realize that we were conditioned into is what keeps people from leaving their day job that they don't like. There's a, there's a sense of fitting into the box or getting it right or not being willing to be messy or take a risk that I feel like unfortunately is a cost of going through the school system. And I'm just curious if you agree and if so, or even if not, what your thoughts are on that and what we should be aware of that might just be part of our sort of programming that we can deprogram once we're aware of it. Yeah, well, I would say this because I want to I want to kind of back into the answer once again through context because it's really important, you know, who I am, who I help, and who we're talking to because my life is helping entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in the making. And so anyone out there in your audience that wants to have their own business, right. they've come to the right place today. <laughs> And, and we are a unique breed. It, our wiring is different and it is genetic. And so my belief, true entrepreneurs, it's about 4% of the population. And so when we talk about academia- Wow, 4%. Oh my gosh. Okay, I was not expecting. I was thought you would say 100% of people could be no, entrepreneurs. No, 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 no. And this is why it's so important. When we talk about the five pieces of content, we'll go to this one particular piece of content that gets to this point. 
But but here's the thing. It is 4% in my humble opinion. And But in looking at some of your past podcasts and what it is that you do, you've attracted the 4%. I'm guessing like 85% of your audience is the 4%. So please, I'm not saying 4% of your audience. No, I I'm, agree. Yeah, I'm saying 4% of 7.5 billion people on the planet. Amazing. So, so to answer the education question, when we're talking to the 4%, yes, academia is not designed for entrepreneurs. And, and so in the first piece of content we'll touch on, it's a book called Entrepreneur Leap. I, I write an entire chapter on college or not for an entrepreneur, and I present all the facts. And um, most of my clients are MBAs, college degrees, but I... I for about 15 years, asked the same question over and over, understanding why they went to college, would they go back? And if they did, why? But here's what's interesting. So first of all, they say they got absolutely nothing out of college that helped them as an entrepreneur from a standpoint of the education and nothing from their MBA. They don't use one thing from their MBA Not as surprised. an entrepreneur, a hundred percent. So, the, but here's what they did say. I said, would you go back? And almost 100% say yes. And I asked why. And they said two things. What I got out of college was the relationships that I have yeah. built that serve me now. And number two, I was able to practice on my fellow students. I would sell them, you know, <laughs> candy and t-shirts and this and that. So with that said, I was somehow intuitively smart enough to know college was not for me. And, you know, it's probably not for most entrepreneurs, unless you want to go for relationships and to practice. Other than that, it's an opportunity to drink and party and have fun. But what you're going to learn there now, the only change, because then I list all the if you're going to go to college, here are all the classes to take, which is feedback from entrepreneurs. Um, there is some good stuff that you can learn as long as you're learning that stuff that's going to serve you sales, psychology. I mean, all this stuff you don't even think makes sense as an entrepreneur. Anyway, long answer to your question. But if you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse, I mean, academia is for certain careers. It's just a, it's, it's not wired and structured for we crazy entrepreneurs. Yeah, it, it's, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. I want to ask you one follow-up question about that before we go on, because you said you, you think there's something in the genetics about it. What do you mean by that? What do you think is a defining characteristic? I know you said there's maybe six of them, but what do you think is one of those things that you think could be genetic that makes somebody an entrepreneur? I love it. And then here's here's what I want to ask it out. I'll, I'll try not to start with context on every answer, but I, I have to do this at least one more time. And, and I do want to quickly give your audience an overview of the five pieces of content I've created, because as we talk, I'll be able to anchor yep. what we're talking about in the content. Beautiful. And I would also love it if we could <clears throat> just kind of stay on a linear path with these five pieces of content, because what your audience is going to see is this is the life of an entrepreneur. And I've created very specific pieces of content for the life of an entrepreneur. And so the first is called Entrepreneurial Leap. And it's a book. Each one of these pieces of content is a book, but it's also a business. And what that is, is that's anyone who thinks that they are an entrepreneur and wants to be an entrepreneur and have their own business. It helps you confirm whether or not you are, give you a glimpse of the life and show you a path on how to do it. And so these questions you're starting to ask, we're in the entrepreneurial leap realm. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. Second piece of content is called rocket fuel. When that entrepreneur reaches a level of success, they've got to find their visionary counterpart, which I call an integrator to take the company to the next level. Third piece of content is called EOS, which is in the book Traction, and that's when the entrepreneur reaches a point when they need to run their business well, and it helps them run a better business and grow and build an amazing business. The fourth piece of content is called the EOS Life, which then helps that entrepreneur live their ideal life, make it to the top of the mountain, for lack of a better term. And then the fifth piece of content is called 10 Disciplines for Managing and Maximizing Your Energy. And that's when you get to the top of the mountain. This is how to literally live your optimal life, but go inside and heal all the crap because most entrepreneurs build it on their trauma, which is okay. It works. That's how I did it. But at some, at some point, it is possible to have inner peace and be at the top of the mountain. And that's what I show you how to do in 10 disciplines. So there's the life of the entrepreneur. You're asking me again, an entrepreneurial leap question. So we're going to go to the first piece of content. 
If, and if anybody's curious how to get to each piece of content, go to my website, genowickman.com. That's the epicenter of everything. But in Entrepreneurial Leap, in the confirmed step of the book, I do everything in my power to talk anyone thinking about starting their own business out of doing it. And it starts mm -hmm. by helping you understand that a true entrepreneur has six essential traits, visionary, passionate, problem solver, driven, risk taker, and responsible. There's an assessment they can take. You score 90 or higher, you are it. But the reason I'm trying to talk you out of it is I'm trying to save lives because everyone wants to be an entrepreneur and it's not all it's cracked up to be. I'm trying to save you 10 years of hell. But if I can't talk you out of it and you do have these six essential traits, holy shit. In other <laughs> words, you are gonna go build an empire if you will please do what I tell you to do in that book. So there's the fastest answer to your question I can give you after the context. I literally swoon when you land on certain things. I'm like, I'm in love with what he just said. It's so <laughs> good. Those things, the problem solver. And then you added responsible at the end and passionate. It was like, that's me. I've never heard it said that way. And by the way, we will put links to all of these books in the show notes and we will send this out to everybody who listens to the show. Um, it's so good. And I have to ask you one follow-up question about Entrepreneurial Leap, because that really is where most of this audience is. Yes. And if they haven't gone through all these books, they really should get all of these for Christmas or whatever holiday you're celebrating and, and just give yourself the gift of going through these books, because you can already tell from listening to Gino that like something is coming alive inside of you and you will feel so much more put in peace and really know what your next steps are by reading the books. But I want to ask you a follow-up and then we'll move on through these five pieces and then we'll land in the 10 disciplines. What is something that would help the person right now who's already figured it out? They've been listening to this show, let's say for three years, five years, whatever. They're like, I, this is me. Every time she has Howard Schultz on or Barbara Court, I'm like, that's me. That's what I want to do. And there's a feeling of fear around putting something out there because my biggest issue I hear from the audience is a, they think it's a business problem, but it more it seems like a courage problem, which is mm -hmm. what if it's not perfect yet? Yeah. What if I'm not ready yet? Like mm -hmm. there's no willingness to be in beta and just test something that's mediocre. It's they, they, they feel like they already have to have the packaging, the website. They already mm -hmm. have to be able to fulfill the 40,000 orders when they haven't even gotten two orders yet. So I'm curious, what's that next that next lily pad that they need to jump to, if we could just free associate, because you wrote a whole book on this, what yeah. would be one thing that you would you would advise? Well, I would say read the book, but that's 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 too easy and fast. So I I'm gonna try to put it in a nutshell, okay? Because what I'm doing in the book, like I said, is helping you confirm whether or not you are see a glimpse of the life and all of your options, and then show you a path to greatly increase your odds of success and help you eliminate half the mistakes you're going to make. So you're asking a really tough question because now I've got to pick one piece of content out of that entire book that is, you know, the next lily pad jump. And, and I, it's a little bit of a different answer for everyone. And so the thought that comes to my mind is, you know, I would urge you to be a collaborator with Entrepreneur Elite because you know, this is your audience. And what that all that means is I give you all of the content for free to freely share with your audience. So one thought is they just need to fill out the assessment and make sure they score 90 or higher. Because as you're talking, the, it literally in all 200 and something pages, what I zero in on first, I want to say a second thing, but what I zero on first is the essential trait of risk taker. Because if you don't have the risk taker trait, and again, it's innate, you are born with it. I'll debate it to my death. I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong. But 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 this risk taker trait, we're a little bit crazy. We take risks. I've lost all of my money three times yeah. between age 18 and 32. Okay. And because I took huge risks, I still do. But the point is, the thing that might be presenting that person from jumping to the next lily pad, as you said, is just fear. And, and they don't have the risk tolerance to do that. And it's okay. And here's what I would suggest. And this is where I want to get to the second part, because now I'm going to just grab another piece of content. Um, <clears throat> so when we get to the second piece of content that I created called Rocket Fuel, 
What I describe is this very powerful relationship I discovered called the visionary integrator dynamic. The visionary is that driven visionary entrepreneur that started, founded, and built the business. The integrator is the person that counterbalances them. They're great at running the day-to-day. -day. <clears throat> so assuming that makes rough con contextual sense, some of your audience will make incredible integrators. They don't have the risk tolerance to go do this thing, right. but man, they could join forces with a visionary, have a 50-50 ownership in the business, and help a visionary build an empire and own 50% of it. Visionaries need integrators. So if you're missing the risk taker trait, it's not hopeless that you can't own your own business. So that, that I want to jump to that. And then the last thing I would say, let's pretend your audience does confirm they have them, does score 90 or higher, and they're just ready to take that next leap, there's a tool I created called My Biz Match. It's, again, all of this is on the website and free, but the point I'm making is it's understand all of your options in the world. And so what's happening right now is everybody thinks becoming a tech billionaire is like the only entrepreneurial option on the planet. And there are literally thousands and thousands of options and the options fall into what industry do you love? Are you a product entrepreneur or a service entrepreneur? Are you a B2B or a B2C entrepreneur? Do you want to sell high price, low volume or low price, high volume? And how big of a business do you want to build? There's no shame in building a $4 million company. So understand your options, because if you're just going to do what your entrepreneur friend does, you're probably going to be miserable. And so for me, the industry I love is education. I love to teach. How ironic. I have utter disdain for <laughs> academia, but I'm a teacher. You're so, great at so it. I love education. I'm a service entrepreneur. I love selling services. I love selling that. I love being the highest price, highest value in town. And I love B2C, business to, con I'm sorry, B2B, business to business. I love selling to CEOs. And I like building companies between five and 10 million. I don't need billion dollar companies. So, so just know that about yourself so that you go down the right path for yourself. Don't just copy the other entrepreneur. Figure out what you're drawn to and go build the business you're built for. Every entrepreneur is not built to build every business. You're a great teacher. Is the when yeah. when you talk, first of all, it's mesmerizing. Everybody's right. like hanging on to every word. God gave you such an ability to like, you're so charismatic, but then you break things down in a way that everybody can like access them. Thank and you. I have to just say a huge thank you because Rocket Fuel completely changed my life because I, when I started my business in 2007, I'm a creative, I'm a risk taker, but I was like, oh, I'm not great at all at the organizing part or at the making a sales page or a funnel. And I was like dying. And I was like, wait, and a friend of mine, I think it was Amy Porterfield. She's like, you have to read Rocket Fuel. Like you're going to totally have a different life after reading this book. Mm -hmm. And then I hired an integrator and God bless. I feel like I literally tell her every day, like my whole life is different because of you. She is the wind beneath my wings. Yeah. And what a service you did by letting entrepreneurs know, hey, hey, you don't also have to have that skill. Like when I... You don't have to be the musician that also produces the song. You can write the song and hire a great producer. So yeah. I just love you for so many reasons. One thing I want to do is a follow-up to what you just said, because you, you do want to, you said before, I want to serve your audience and something that comes up for my audience. And I'm curious what your, what your thought is. You said in that whole beautiful monologue, you said, I want to be the highest price, highest value in town. Mm -hmm. And the women that I talk to and I'm generalizing, but I speak to mostly women, there's such a fear in charging. There's this codependent dance around, well, if I put this offer out there for my service or my product or my event, and what if someone can't afford it? What if someone says no? And I say to myself, and I've said this now to them, this is a guess, but it's a, just a guess based on observation. I say, what are you doing? It's business. I don't see in general, men do that. I just see people like, are you in? Are you out? Deal or no deal? Cool. No. Great. Let's go play golf. You're in. Great. Let's go play golf. Like it's probably very much relevant too for men that they get scared, yeah. but I love the way you brazenly in a very clean way, just say, this is what works for me. I like being the highest price, highest value. Here's who I'm for. Here's who I'm not. There's no codependent. There's nothing sticky. It's just very clear. This is what is. 
that if I had to pinpoint something that keeps all of the very educated, brilliant, good-hearted, empathetic humans who listen to this show from where they want to be, it's that fear of just saying on very simple, plain, plain language, this is what I charge and letting somebody have the autonomy to make a decision. Yes or no. Here. Can you please just speak to that for a second? And then we're going to dive right into the 10 disciplines. Sure. Um, <clears throat> oh my God, you prompted so many thoughts. So right now I'm, I'm doing Sophie's choice. Picking <laughs> oh no. I have to get rid of just to get to get, give you the best one I've got. So, um, you know, to, again, in Entrepreneur Leap, I teach this as well. I talk about pricing and, you know, it's, it, women are not alone. Men suffer with the same thing, but yes, there is a little bit different dynamic there. But what I've learned and discovered that almost every startup undervalues themselves and undercharges. And, and, and what I've learned is it's psychological. We don't feel like we're worth it. Okay. And so, with EOS Worldwide, a system I created, we have EOS implementers. We have 550 all over the world helping companies implement EOS, and each implementer chooses their own fee. And it's a really fascinating process because, again, when I started doing this, my fee was here. It's now here. And you go through a process of choosing your fee and then raising your fees at interval. And it's really funny because every time I unveil a fee increase to my clients, like nobody even skips a beat and the anxiety anxiety and I'm like why didn't I do that a year ago so we're all so maybe men hide it better but we're all suffering from that so I would suggest two things on that and then maybe I'll get to a third point I'll look at the clock but but the first is you know Dan Sullivan one of my greatest mentors talks about pricing and he says, here's how you choose price. He says, pick the number that scares the hell out of you and add 20%. So that's that's a little fun thing, but there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, next is Casey Brown. Okay, this woman is amazing. If you watch her TED Talk, she's a pricing wizard genius. And what she does is she teaches the psychology of what's really going on when you're undervaluing yourself when you're not communicating your value. So watch her TED talk. It is amazing. But what that is all about, so that's a resource I offer. Just watch it. And you'll It'll help you understand and build your confidence. But yes, ultimately, you get to a point where, you know, the two really quick stories I, I, that prompted came to me as you were sharing that is I presented my fee uh, way back. This goes back probably 15 years ago. And when I presented my fee to this new client, a woman on the team goes, how do you sleep at night? And I turned and I looked it right in the eye and I said, like a baby <laughs> and moved on. So the good news is they did move forward, but you, you can't please everyone. You know, there's something going on inside of her that I'm not going to let it affect me. I know the value, what I bring, they're printing money when they bring me into their company to help them build their company. So, so, so there's, headwinds that we all face because you know there are people on this earth that don't feel we deserve it and then the other thing that came to mind is um a client also a woman ironically when i get paid at the end of every session it's just a funky way i work i come from the speaking world and um the woman said to me it's so it fascinates me how comfortable you are with money and talking about money. And, and I, and I said, listen, I just provided you a tremendous amount of value. I deserve it. It's like a no brainer to me. So it's, it's all psychological is what I would say. And so I hope in there was something to glean, but we all deal with it. My point with the 550 implementers, every single one of them went through this and they're all over the place. You know, they're charging anywhere from $3,500 a day to $10,000 a day. And it's all based on where they are. They choose their own and it all starts up here. I'm pointing to my head. So anyway, for what that's worth. Oh that's my gosh. I loved all of it. And the part that I think is my favorite is how you are able to be so humble and share that for yourself. When you go to raise your own rate, why didn't I do that a year ago? People had no issue with the anxiety that I felt. And it's just very humble and generous for you to take us behind the scenes of your own world, because I, I feel that as well. And I wouldn't even put myself in the same pricing or market part of the world as you are. And I, I also feel that way. Um, and it is psychological and it's fascinating how easy life gets to be when you can break through those psychological 
barriers because they're just an illusion, right? Yeah, and if I may, I, I would be remiss if I didn't add one more thing because on the other side of that, I am creating a tremendous amount of value for my clients. So what's also important for your audience is to make sure they're adding value. And so I always lovingly like to say, you cut a lawn, that's worth 25 bucks an hour. You populate Mars, that's worth billions of dollars. And so you got to look at the value because if you're not creating value, then there's no way you're going to get what you're charging. And so you have to obsess about making sure you're providing that level of value, get constant feedback from yeah. your customers and clients telling you that, yes, this is that valuable. So, you know, you can't, you can't charge a thousand dollars to cut each lawn. Okay. That you're never going to get a penny doing that. So you got to be providing equal value or it's, for much, much greater value. It's a very fair point. It's a very fair point. You know, you're getting paid to solve a problem and are you solving one? So, now, one of the things I want to dive into with the 10 disciplines is really important, especially again, for my audience, because women sometimes sabotage themselves when they think that in order to be successful, they will have to, it will cost them their quality of life. It'll cost them their time with their, their kids, their mental health. And they say to themselves, okay, they make a very quick decision and decide then therefore I can't have that. Mm -hmm. And so they stay in maybe a nine to five, but at least they feel like there's some level of, of, of more uh, containment with that. And, and I think what's so important about these 10 disciplines, especially in the season I'm in right now is how do we not only create a life that's successful in air quotes, where we've achieved the seven figures, the multi, all that, the house, the three house, but now are you enjoying that life? Are you reaping the spoils? Do you feel as though you, you have any sense of well-being? Because if you don't, what in air quotes does success mean? And so there's such beauty in what you put here. And I'd love for you to dive into Whatever those things are that that stand, I mean, we can go through the 10, we can go through whichever ones you want, but whatever just came up for you when I was speaking out those those thoughts, like why why did this feel so important for you to share? And what might be the most important ones for us to start with so that we know that once we get to the top of this mountain, we don't have to keep this hustle culture as the only way that we live and breathe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here's what comes up for me. And, and if you'll allow me this contextual riff, and I'm, I'm thinking about your audience and they're going, well, will he shut the F up? Not at all. Saying, oh, that's really good context. <laughs> so I'm going so to go back to the context and I'm going to do a little bit of a riff. And again, this is what comes up for me. So now we go back to those five pieces of content and they definitely were in a sequential linear order. And again, very quickly, entrepreneur leap. Rocket Fuel, EOS, EOS Life, 10 Disciplines. Well, now we're jumping all the way to the end of that life of the entrepreneur to 10 Disciplines. <clears throat> and a couple of really important things. The first four pieces of content that I just shared helps an entrepreneur in any psychological condition build a really successful company and have an incredibly balanced life. Mm, balance. When we get into the fifth piece of content, then 10 disciplines, this is where we start to go inside and heal the traumatized entrepreneur that built an empire on their trauma, speaking from experience. And everything that I teach, <clears throat> there's a great quote by Danielle Kennedy that says, we teach what we needed the most. So Entrepreneurial Leap was me, a mislabeled derelict at 18 years old, an entrepreneur in the making. I just thought I was a derelict, you know? And so I, I did not know I was an entrepreneur in the making. And so that's written for anyone at any age. Understand that, you know, EOS, Rocket Fuel, EOS Life was all created because I helped my entrepreneurial father save the family business. And, and, and so 10 Disciplines is all about going inside and doing the inner work. But what I want to say, and the first thing that's coming up for me is, you have a lot of your audience that have not taken their entrepreneurial leap, okay? And this is the one of the five pieces of content, 10 disciplines that can be taken out of order, but I've not proven it yet. So please, Kathy, you prove it with your audience. But here's what I'm trying to say, okay? <laughs> and so there's this amazing book called Driven by Dr. Douglas Brackman, and it's a masterpiece. And what it's helping to understand is we driven people, i.e. entrepreneurs, 
It's genetic, it's DNA, and it's a blessing and a curse because we borderline kill ourselves. We are, um, um, I'm trying to pick the perfect word. It's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't. We are, um, it's not distraught. And I don't want to say the F word, although I love saying it often, but we're <laughs> effed up. So it's this blessing and a curse that we have this drive, this superhuman strength and energy to build empires while at the same time, internally, we're a mess, okay? And so the, 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 I did his podcast and the debate he and I had is so what comes first? Because all I know in my life for the last 30 years is you take the traumatized entrepreneur and help them build an empire on their trauma and then start healing the entrepreneur when they have time to do that. Well, the other side of it is maybe you heal the entrepreneur first and then have them build the empire. You know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Well, I don't know. You can do both. All I've proven is that, you know, I can help them heal after building the empire. So my point with your audience, what an opportunity, because I don't have experience because this content has not been out long enough to take, you know, your 85% audience that are entrepreneurs in the making that are about to take their leap and let's get them living by the 10 disciplines before they make their leap. Let's heal them on the inside before they take their leap. And holy cow, I mean, I don't know what that means. I don't know what happens, but I would think something pretty great comes of it. But all I can speak to from experience as we go to 10 disciplines is the state of the audience that I know and have experience with. And it's the entrepreneur, man or woman, that have made it to the top of the mountain. They've succeeded by every external measure on the planet. They've got the company, they got the money, they got the people, but they feel empty on the inside. They just don't feel whole and complete. Speaking from experience, what the 10 disciplines do is they help build a foundation, a platform to create space. And that space then helps you go inside to that really scary place, admit what's really going on in there, and then shed all the layers, as I like to call it. So with that said, there's my contextual riff and jumping it. off point. And then you tell me where you want to go. I mean, from. all of your riffs are like my favorite. I just want to <laughs> sit and listen to your riffs all the time. I've never heard anyone say this. I, um, I had Tony Robbins here maybe like 10 months ago. And I said to him, I said, I just want to kiss your forehead and give you a hug. <laughs> and he goes, no, nobody makes me blush, but that made me blush because <laughs> there's a sweetness in you. Yeah. And I said, you know why I say it? I say, because I've been listening to you since I was like 15. I think I bought his first cassettes. And I said, when I saw you live, I felt like this person's been through a lot of trauma because mm. you didn't get off the stage till two in the morning and your voice was barely there. And we got our value in the first 90 minutes because yeah. you're really a pro. And he said, you're totally right. Yep. And I said, and it hurts me because I wanted to use this moment then to at least let you know, I got it. I see it. It's beautiful. It's its own thing. Right. And he's like, you're going to make me cry because I'm now really looking at that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's, I, I get that. You know, I, I came to LA with nothing, nothing. My, my single mom, we didn't have anything and built a multi-million dollar business and had three kids. And it's like, at what point I'm, I said to my husband, I'm compulsive. I don't stop. I'm like, I'm going to, I've had three kids in the last, you know, 10 years and built this business. It's like, you'd think I would just have three, three weeks off. Never have never done it. Can't do it. It's, it's, you just said it. What would happen if we created this space? Right. And it's not coming from scarcity because the money thing has always done. I've done well with that dance. That's been really good. It's the compulsion of being in doer mode. It's the compulsion of like solving the next problem, creating the next thing. It's some fix. It's a way, it's an addiction of sorts. And I'm very aware of it. And I can't really find a way now to stop it. But I love that you're really seeing that. And when you just said that, I have to be honest, I'm like, I don't know. Like if a person didn't have trauma, would they, they might, my guess is, I'm just guessing, they might be very content to then sit down and row a boat. Like, I don't know. I feel like I look at Gary V and like my friends and like, we come from the stuff, like that's pushing behind us. And, you know, Howard Schultz has become a, a sort of a mentor. I'm like, he grew up in public housing. Like this guy did not have any kind of lush life that he had, you know? And 
I wonder, we'll see if your experiment is correct. But given the fact that I personally and probably many of my audience members can relate to what you just said, let's dive into how we can begin the healing process because it's it's beautiful that you're even willing to share and raise your hand that yeah. you've even done any of this. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, and you prompted three really big things that I have to respond to. And then, and then we'll do a quick overview of the 10 and then we can drill down on what you want. But I, I want to say, I hope I remember all three, but I'm just going to just flow with this because here's what's important for your audience to know. You can build an empire on your trauma. And if you're not ready to go inside, it's okay. You don't have to go inside. In other words, the good news is I've proven you can really build a nice empire. Uh, my hopes for you is that you do both. The answer is really to do both. And I believe it's possible to do both. But I, but I want to make sure that that's clear um, because we're going into uncharted territory. Number two, you know, I have this, <clears throat> these two overriding thoughts, you know, so I, I have this thought because I'm going to be putting all of this in a, in a, in a bigger, more robust book. And I'm going to really simplify this inner work and mastery and healing because I feel like I see it pretty clearly but the point is the the title I play around with as a joke is how I found my soul and kept my business and then I have this second saying that I always say as I started doing this kind of work about 20 years ago is my deepest fear was that I was going to become enlightened and just want to sit in a hut because I'm a worker, I'm a creator, I'm a builder, I need to produce. And here's what I think I've learned. And Dr. Doug Brackman of The Driven Book swears that if you will heal the inside, you will literally be 10 times more driven. You literally be. And, and I'm starting to believe it because while I've been doing this really deep work for 20 years, the last two years have been very profound. I have gone really, really deep. And what I'm no learning for myself is number one, I'm feeling more, I felt more peace in the last year than I did in the previous 40 years. And my creativity is through the roof. My clarity is through the roof. Wow. And all I want to do is create and produce more. So, so, you know, where I'm heading with all of this is this, the, this working together of two very important, profound things. And that is producing, and you, we can call that all the words work produce, create, add value to the world, combined with peace and balance. And I do believe it's possible to do both. And, and more importantly than that, I think it's possible to be even more impactful. And so we call it freedom, creativity, and impact. We're going to increase your freedom. We're going to increase your creativity. And we're going to create your, create, increase your impact. And that's what I'm personally experiencing. But th that is like literally the first time I've said that out loud because it's, I'm a work in progress. In other words, all I'm doing is sharing where I am on this journey. And, and I don't know where I am on the journey to peace. Like if there's a scale from zero to hundred percent, I don't know if I'm like 1% in or 99% in, I hope I'm a lot closer to hundred percent because what happens is every time you go inside and shed a layer, there's pain, there's crying, you're bringing stuff up. But when it's finally gone, the peace is incredible. But the process is so painful. And so that's why I say I hope I'm a lot closer to 100%. Because if I'm at one, and it's probably closer to one, and I've got 99% more to shed. Holy shit. But anyway, I'm all in. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is, um, you know, we're going to go through these 10 disciplines. And I urge your audience if you haven't started your business, let's pretend you have, but if you haven't and you're thinking that you have to do it in that chronological order, you know, help Kathy and I prove to the world that it's possible to do it in reverse and just start living by these 10 disciplines because I, I want to do a high level riff to make my point. But if you can take control on the front end of starting your business, a lot of which I did, I think you will build a better business have balance in your life, be able to do all of those other things. And so, so here it goes. I'm going to do a real high level riff of the 10 and explain what I mean. And I'm going to try and do this in two minutes or less. Okay. Tall order, but I think I can do this. And then we're going to drill down on whatever you want to drill down on. Perfect. So here they are. Number one is 10 year thinking. Point is just seeing you in your life at least 10 years from now 
everything starts to change. And again, this is all about managing energy, but creating space. Number two is taking time off. So just do the simple math on that. If you will start taking time off, what we're making everyone do at a minimum is take 130 days off. That's the starting point. I take 165 days off a year. I built EOS Worldwide, taking the month of sabbatical off from the day I founded that company. 22 years of building that company, I took the month of August off every year. It's possible. So take time off. Number three, know thyself. This is the inner work where you start to really understand yourself fully so that you can fully be yourself in the world. I like to call that letting your freak flag fly. Number four is being still. So stillness is all about whatever you call it, meditation, prayer, journaling, whatever you do in your silent time. But what, at a minimum, what we urge is you take 10 to 30 minutes every day in total stillness. The magic is inside of you. You got to start to bring it up. Stuff is going to come up. Aha moments, downloads, whatever you want to call them. Number five is know your 100%. This is now we go to your work container and we say, what is the magic number amount of time that is your maximum output? So know your 100% says, how many weeks a year? How many hours a week are you going to work? I work 40 weeks a year. I work 55 hours a week. That is my magic formula. This will take you a couple of years to dial in your formula. We are all different. Some entrepreneurs work less than I do. Some work more. But this is the maximum output where I can deliver my value, my craft to the world, make maximum dollars. And then everything outside of that is everything else but work. And, and I did a podcast where the podcaster described this so well. He said, it's like your car with that little gauge that tells you when you're getting like the maximum miles per gallon. And if you stay right there at like 58 miles per hour, you'll get the maximum mileage. It's the same kind of things because it's, it's determining your maximum mileage where an hour more a week or a week more a year, you're going to burn out and anything less than that, you start to get bored. Number six is say no, dot, 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 often. Once you are living by the first five disciplines, it's abundantly clear everything you must say no to in your life. And so it's all about getting really good at saying no. I love telling people no. And so you got to get past that psychological issue. You had um, Greg McGowan on as a guest, masterful book on helping you learn how to say no. Everybody go back and listen to that episode. Um, number seven is don't do $25 an hour work. So once you understand your maximum output, and if you think about it, you're making $500 an hour, why would you do $25 an hour work? If you're making $50 an hour, why would you do $25 an hour work? So simple math on how to really leverage yourself. Number eight, prepare every night. And so that is before your head hits the pillow, lay out tomorrow in chronological order so that you sleep better. You've got to restore every night in your sleep. Magic happens when you are sleeping. You need eight hours. And so a good night's rest. And then you wake up and you hit the ground running. Number nine, put everything in one place. A very powerful discipline. We crazy, visionary, driven entrepreneurs, we have lots of ideas. We're making lots of commitments, promises. You need to put it all in one place as you go throughout your day because you're letting people down. You're disappointing them. It's too distracting. And number 10 is be humble. And so you have a choice in life. I look at it as a spectrum. You can live a humble life or an arrogant life. And I'm just here to tell you, a humble life is a hell of a lot better. I'm always a work in progress. You know, I, it's, and, and I always urge you to just measure yourself. But, but I recommend gratitude. It's really hard to be grateful and appreciative for everything in your life and be arrogant. But it's a choice that you make. And, I, and the journey, your energy, the impact you will have on the world, I believe, is much greater if you're humble. And so there's my... Tried to do it in two minutes, probably took four, but there's my rip. You did great. Um, so they're all really powerful. And when we were approaching this topic, we were talking about how you can heal the trauma. And one of the things you talk about in these 10 is going inside in terms of knowing thyself. And then you talk about stillness also, which is another one of them, but they, mm -hmm. they definitely seem like they go together. And then some of the other ones have to do with things that will set you up for more well-being, it seems like. But in terms of actually healing the trauma, which one of those do you think that I nailed it by talking about the know thyself and the being still as the ones that will really actually help you to be aware of whatever the trauma is and to allow yourself to move through it or with it 
and, uh, and tell us a little bit more about that yeah, and how, and how, how that worked for you. Yeah. And so really important, you know, all 10 are vital because they magnify each other. It's truly like a puzzle when the whole puzzles together, all 10 pieces are together. They all work together to make yeah. everything better. And I, so I'm not going to, we don't have time for me to go into each one and show this is truly how it creates the platform to create space, to go inside and master the inside. So I like how you're picking those two because the two you've picked are the most obvious high gain and, and where the, the, a big part of where the magic happens. I just want to be careful because without the other eight, it won't be as effective. And so mm -hmm. in other words, if you're like working your ass off seven days a week, 12 hours a right. day, this nothing's going to help you. That you, makes sense. Because you haven't stopped. And, and if you're not saying no, so they all go together. So it's really hard for me to just jump to your answer without saying that. Going to stillness and know thyself. The next thing I want to say is, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychologist. Nope. <laughs> I, am, I, I am not good enough to heal people's deep trauma. And the way I view it, it's creating awareness. And there are literally a thousand ways to heal trauma. And then there's a scale. Some of us have minor trauma and some of us have incredibly deep trauma. And, and so I'm... I want to I want to be careful and make sure that context is clear because again what happens with this 10 discipline platform and this opening that's created and this opportunity to create space to do that I promise you you will be led to the right resource for you and sometimes it's just a damn therapist and you need to do your 7 years of therapy sometimes it's some incredible healer sometimes it's something extreme I don't know I don't want to go through all 1000 but Sometimes it's really simple, sometimes it's really heavy, but you'll know where to go again once you create space. And so now to go right to the answer of your question, stillness, know thyself. Let's start with know thyself because the way I say it is, the truth of it is I should have worded it as be yourself because that's my goal is that you be yourself, but you can't be yourself until you know thyself. And so we got to start there and figure out who you are. And this is everything from all the tangible goodness that you are. In other words, the skill sets you have in your personality, but it's also the inside stuff going on in terms of, you know, what the pain is, what the trauma is, what drives you, what's going, and just looking at everything and going, this is the being that I am. And, and it's, that is a never ending journey. So like I said, I don't know where I am on the zero to a hundred scale. <laughs> Again, I hope it's closer to hundred percent, but you just start going there. And honest to God of the thousand things, a great first step. Sometimes we just recommend somebody Fill out a profiling tool. Go take your Colby and understand how your energy works when you work. So it's not like it's all this like deep, traumatic uh, psychoanalysis. So I it's hear. all kinds of stuff, but it's ultimately understanding the beautiful sculpture that you are. And then doing what I like to say is let your freak flag fly fully being that in the world. And I always love to share this story. My wife threw me a 30th surprise birthday party. I show up. 100 sets of eyeballs yell surprise. And I look around the room and there's six factions of my life. There's my business partners, my employees, my high school friends, my new friends, my family, and my wife's family. And I looked around the room and I go, holy cow. Now I get to use profanity when I'm quoting someone. I just happen to be quoting myself. But I look around this room and I go, holy fuck. Who am I going to be today? Because I was a different person for every one of those factions. You want to talk about energy management, I, the way I had to change myself. For each person. And it was that day I said, I am going to just be me because I was six different versions of myself. And it's like, once you understand that, boom, be yourself. And so know thyself. I just felt that fully. I fully just, just felt that. Yeah. And it's just, you, so all you're doing is you're chipping away at the marble, chipping away at the marble, chipping away at the marble, figuring out the sculpture that you are. So you can just be that in the world. And then stillness, you know, I am a meditator. There's lots of ways to do it. You know, if you're very religious, then pray. If, if you have a journal and you like to sit and journal, it's all great magic, but it's all about stillness and you've got to calm your body and just calm yourself and let it all come in. And it comes in from all different places. Sometimes you're going to feel this pain like 
right here or here or here or here and just sit with that. Just let that process because what you've done for the last 40 fucking years is you kept pushing that thing down and pushing that thing down. And when you it starts to come up, you're like, oh, I'll go watch a movie. I'll go read a book. I'll go do some work. Let it come up. Just sit there and let it come up and feel it and process it. And all of a sudden, poof, it goes away and you feel a little more peace. Sometimes it's a download that God only knows where it comes from. I always jokingly say it came out of nowhere, which means it came from somewhere. But in stillness, magic just happens. I don't know how to describe it. Just do it. And 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 the more you practice stillness for years and years and years and years, it just keeps getting better and better and better. And I, I'm not an expert. I'm just, I'm on this journey too. I'm on this path. Oh, but there's my quick best answer to your two examples. It's so it's so beautiful. And uh, I just want to say for me personally, I, I uh, for my 40th birthday, which was lucky enough because of the circumstances, it was right before the pandemic. And it was December before the pandemic hit that following March. I went to a place called Onsite. Do you know what Onsite is? I do not. Anyway, it's like seven days of like, you have to give away your phone. Ooh, I love it. Like it's a very, Hoffman, right? I don't know. I, I only know exactly. Of Hoffman, like a very, Hoffman, yeah. very much like that yeah. therapy, but bougie. It's an hour outside of Nashville. Oh yeah. And you don't, you're not allowed to say your last name or what you do. And I was like, I'm not going, I'm not going, but certain people referred me to it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go. And when I was leaving uh, in the bookstore, Donald Miller's book, Scary Close was in the bookstore. And I know Donald Miller as like a colleague and he's been on the show a few times. I know him from like business stuff and story brand. No, no. This book was about his trip to onsite. And I read it on the way home. And what I built in my business le- coming home from that week was thousands and thousands of light years beyond everything that I had done before that, because yeah. exactly what you said, I chiseled away. I, I shedded, I dropped so much of a need for the belonging that I felt other people needed me to be that I was able to finally come back to just what's really an authentic version of me. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, following what you're saying, the next journey I was led to was 10 day long Vipassana retreats. And mm-hmm. I kicked and screamed, I am not going, this is not going to work for me. And I became a meditator mm-hmm. and I, the, the, the sunburn feeling the first time I sat there and tried to do that, <laughs> I felt like someone was peeling my skin off. That's how uncomfortable that it was to sit awesome. still. And awesome. then I learned what it is to feel connected to the witness that's witnessing all the spinning. And I went, Oh my God, I feel free for the first Mm. time in my life. Mm. And so it's such a joy to talk with you, Gino, because not only do you have such fun and in-depth understanding of business, but I don't always get the pleasure of hearing all of that content with this deep integrated love of life, (laughs) like really what life gets to feel like where it really gets to be easy. So I appreciate you so much for this. And I want everyone to get their hands on it. And uh, I'm curious for you as a follow-up, and this is sort of, we're going to end in a couple of minutes. A lot of people get really intimidated when I talk about being still Mm -hmm. and meditating. And I get it because for me, it was not appealing at all in the beginning. What's your um, particular meditation practice? Because there's a zillion different flavors. Mm-hmm. And when somebody is curious, but feeling overwhelmed by it, what advice or, or guidance do you have so that they might ease themselves into it and feel like it is something that they could access as opposed to just feeling completely like, yeah, just over their skis. Yeah, sure. And, and by the way, if you would send me those two resources, if you could ask your producer to email those two resources you mentioned, I like co- collecting them and being aware of them, and I may do one. So uh, if you wouldn't mind doing that, that'd be awesome. Okay. Um, so here, here's my answer to that. You know, so first of all, again, just little old me and my belief, and that is, I believe your ego does not want you to meditate. But your soul 
want you to meditate, okay? Yeah. And so if you're fighting it, you are full on in ego mode. And the last thing your ego wants you to do is go inside and please understand your ego is good. Your ego is there to help you. This is not, you never kill the ego. That's gonna be a life of hell. You try and do that. You embrace your ego. And so understand your ego has been protecting you your whole life. Your ego a million years ago is protecting you from a saber-toothed tiger, okay? And please understand, freedom to your ego is a saber-toothed tiger. It doesn't know what to do, what to do with peace and freedom because it's just trying to protect you. So that's the first thing I would say is that's your ego. Listen to your soul. Your soul wants you to meditate. Or I should say have stillness, okay? Your soul wants you to have some sort of stillness. And then for anybody struggling with it, <clears throat> just do 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. So for everyone, I advise this, this tends to work. If worst case five, but try just 10 minutes and, and just try that every day. Worst case three times a week, just try it. But when you go in knowing if I'm resisting this, if I'm having trouble, if my head is spinning, if I can't turn off my brain, that's just your ego fighting like hell. And that's the best answer I can give you in a short period of time. That makes me want to cry. I just love it because I got, and I've had every possible opportunity to have a conversation about meditation. And I just love what you just said, because you got, you got to a lot really, really fast. And one thing that you said that not everybody usually includes is like, don't try to overcome this ego. Like, I think that that is really a paradigm shift. What you just said not that no one's ever said that, but it's not usually a part of the beginning and the end of every conversation, which is, this is, I, I saw it in Batman once, right? The Joker said, Batman says to the Joker, that's it. I'm going to end you. And he says, oh no, you will never end me. And he says, no, no, I'm, I'm going to end you now. And he says, no, don't you get it? Without me, you're not Batman. <laughs> and I'm like, full body chills. Yeah. Like, that's awesome. It's not going away and it doesn't have to. It's the, it's the, it's the joy in just the dance and having the moments of like, just the full awareness of this. And I love that you just named that at the, at the, at the start um, of what you're saying, because it's so important. So yeah, and, and, and you prompted two thoughts and I'll say them really fast. Number one is when you do this, don't expect anything. So when we talk about the magic, right. that happened, oh man, if you expect something, you're about two years away from anything happening. So don't expect anything because, and I'm no expert, please. I'm no expert, but listen, I still have meditations where I'll sit there for a half hour. I do a half hour every day. Sometimes they run as long as an hour, but I'll sit there for a half hour and I'll be like, this sucked. So, so please it's, don't expect a single thing to happen. Just be still and trust it. And number two, this whole point about ego and soul, you know, the, the other thing I'm learning, you know, is that every decision we make is out of love or fear, right? Love is soul fear is ego. And so I have a friend that describes it as, as you go throughout your day, as things come in and pop up or decisions you make, just keep asking yourself, you know, was that soul in love or was that fear and ego? And what you're going to find and for most of us is like 90% our ego, fear-based decisions and things that are coming up. And so it's just all about awareness. So just be aware, you start to be aware and, and the magic will eventually happen. It's a journey. Well, this is magic. I've done 700 episodes and this is very much stays at the top of my mind so is like, nice. what is one of my most favorite conversations? Mm -hmm. uh, you are such a full and total person. Just you, you bring so much richness in your presence, which is the most delightful part. So thank you. Tell everybody, uh, just remind everybody, you said it before, but where they can follow along and find mm -hmm. you and get into all these resources. And then we'll put links to everything you mentioned in the show notes. Yeah. Well, I greatly appreciate that opportunity. So I would start with, you know, 10 disciplines, was the focus of this podcast. And so all things 10 disciplines is the 10 disciplines.com. There is a free ebook. So the 10 disciplines is a free ebook. So you don't have to buy a book for this. Please read it. Start living by those. If you want help, we offer group coaching, get in the group coaching program. Um, and then we do a weekly article that my partner, Rob and I write, we alternate it, but we call it discoveries for the driven. So it's great content, lots of fun, all about the inner work. Okay. It's all about the inner work. Um, and the 10 disciplines. 
And then anything regarding all five pieces of content, just go to genowickman.com and you'll find all five there and you can click on the appropriate piece of content. Uh, but that's kind of the epicenter of everything I've created and where I spend my time, my working time, my 100% working container. I love it. And we're so, it's it's such a gift to be in your audience and just to sit here and absorb it all. It was just really so nourishing. Thank you so, so much for making the time. You're awesome. Yeah. And I would say to you, I could not have done this podcast a year ago. The timing is right. When I looked at all your past episodes, I said, wow, the timing is perfect for this one. So it's been <laughs> a pleasure. You're awesome at what you do, Kathy. Keep up the great work and uh, let's help some people. Okay. Thank you, Gino. God bless you. I hope our paths cross again. All the best.